Hello, my name is James Lagomarsino, and this is my partner, Meg Height, and we are members of Citizens Climate Lobby. And we are volunteers, and we're here to share with you information about the climate crisis, the causes, the effects, and the solutions. So, we're starting out with this particular quote from Carl Safina, which says, for better or worse, we shape the future in the present. And although this can be true of many issues, I think it is as true of any issue as it is for climate change. So solving the climate crisis is going to be a challenge. But the good news is there is an effective path forward if we can make it happen soon. Our agenda today is essentially going to be to talk about what we already know about the climate crisis and who is Citizens Lob Lobby and what do they support for a solution and what kinds of actions can you and I make in order to maintain a livable world. One thing we often do with people is we ask them to kind of think about what they already know about climate change. And you might fall into one of the four categories from knowing very little to knowing a great deal. A lot of people are somewhere in the middle there. The reason that this is really important is that I have found over the 23 years that I have been studying and teaching and talking to people about climate science, I have found that those with the greatest amount of knowledge have the greatest concern and are most likely to see that we need to make significant efforts to diminish our carbon footprints now. Of course, climate scientists are all there. Over 97% of them agree that global warming is real, that it is happening, and it has been happening for a while. They also know that it is caused by increased greenhouse gases which come from burning fossil fuels. So human activity is causing almost all of the increase we're seeing in the climate change. So we said that fossil fuel burning is the biggest driver of this uh, climate change. And if we look at this graph, we see that since 1860, most of the carbon uh, emissions have happened since 1950. Between 1860 and 1950, there's been a very slow linear increase in the use of fossil fuels. After 1950, we see on the graph that the use of oil, gas, and coal go up at an accelerating rate. And this is really what concerns scientists and should concern all of us about the use of fossil fuels. This chart here kind of indicates to us how our atmosphere works as a greenhouse. Um, it's important to understand that we're very fortunate on this planet to have a almost perfect atmosphere that lets in enough of the energy to warm our planet, but lets off enough to keep us from getting too warm. Our energy comes from the sun in short wave energy and passes through the atmosphere easily. When it strikes the earth, it warms the earth and changes into long wave thermal energy. Most of that is captured, keeping us nicely at a livable temperature. But as greenhouse gases increase, our atmospheric blanket becomes thicker and traps more heat causing the planet to warm. If we look at our two planetary neighbors, Mars has a very thin atmosphere, and its temperature can go up to 70 degrees on a day time temperature. But at night, it will plummet down to more than 100 degrees below zero. Conversely, our other neighbor, Venus, has a very thick atmosphere, and it traps in a tremendous amount of heat causing its average temperatures to be more than 600 degrees Fahrenheit. So keeping our atmosphere at the right uh, density is really important to our future. As we look at this, we see that 
The 20 warmest years ever on record have occurred during the past 22 years. And this is because we have seen a sharp increase in that time in the amount of CO2, the greenhouse gas most responsible for trapping heat energy. And if we look, we see that the warmest five years have happened in the last five years between 2014 and 2018. The correlation is unmistakable. So what are we up against? What are the effects that are challenging us? Well, we could talk about that literally for days. There have been many books written about this, and more and more people are becoming concerned about these effects. Mostly, we're going to continue to see record-setting temperatures, which are going to lead directly to a increased number of heat stroke deaths, particularly in cities around the world, which are already happening. We're going to certainly see more extreme weather events, including stronger storms with flooding and drought. The reason for this is because warm air holds more moisture than cooler air. And so this fuels the storms, makes them stronger, and carries more liquid with them. But because climate change is also changing some of the weather, weather patterns, while we may see some areas that are getting wetter, we're going to see some areas that are getting drier. And of course, they're going to experience problems with uh, crop failures as well as fires. Rising sea levels are an increasing problem because we're seeing the warmer temperatures are melting, glaciers, and the ice caps, and the Greenland ice sheet. In addition to that, we're seeing the ocean's temperatures rise, and we're seeing the acidity levels within the uh, oceans become increasingly dangerous. And this is particularly difficult for various fish species, but the acidity levels are really threatening the coral reefs, which are the second most diverse places on the planet second only to our um, jungles and our rainforests. The increasing sea level rise might only be a couple inches, but that will result in a huge storm surge, as much as a half mile or more inland, threatening low-lying areas, particularly areas like Florida, Louisiana, and Southeast Asia, where millions are at risk for being displaced. Food and water insecurity is already happening and will continue to accelerate. This happens because there are crop failures due to droughts and flooding. Also, water that is potable is already at risk in many, many areas. And as we continue to see more pollution and more evaporation of fresh water supplies, that's going to put even more pressure on water security. Health impacts are massive, and we already are seeing over 7 million deaths around the world due to air pollution. But increasing the pollution that we're putting into the air is going to lead to more of those deaths, plus it's going to increase diseases. Pressure will happen on things like um, emphysema and asthma. And we're also going to see pests increasing as they continue to multiply and move into new areas. Areas that once couldn't support a mosquito population because they were too uh, cool are beginning to see mosquitoes moving in and the spread of malaria and dengue fever. For us around here, I'm sure we all have seen the increase in the tick populations. And 30 years ago, that wasn't a problem. The economic costs are going to be huge, and they already are being felt. We pay a certain price for our gasoline and fuel oil, but as we know, we're also having to pay increased prices for all sorts of things to cover storm damage and the loss of crops. 
This causes a lot of stress and anxiety for a lot of people, especially those who are aware of the problem. One thing most of us must remember is that climate change effects, many of them are not reversible. We can't just go back to things the way they were. So how long do we have? Well, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, reports that we have 12 years to cut our global emissions in half. And why do they pick these numbers? Well, the numbers are chosen in order to keep our overall global temperatures below 1.5 degree rise, degrees Celsius, beyond what we found in pre-conditions when we started burning fossil fuels. A lot of people feel that climate change is something that climate scientists and environmentalists and groups that are concerned with those types of things are the ones that are really concerned about this. But in fact, we have seen more and more recently, more and more government agencies becoming concerned. And particularly, we know that because 190 nations signed on to the Paris Accord. We also know that 130 nations contribute to the IPCC report. And so it's not just the environmentalists, it's actually our own government agencies. In the fourth national climate assessment, which was conducted by 14 different governmental agencies and um, departments, they compiled a 1,500-page report in which they all had to agree on the problem of climate crisis. And these included the U.S. Departments of Commerce, Agriculture, Energy, Transportation, Department of Interior and State, Health and Human Services, and the Department of Defense. And I would remind you that our own Pentagon has stated that climate change is the second greatest threat to world stability, second only to nuclear war. So I know you might want me to read you all 1,500 pages of that report, but I'm going to just read to you this last paragraph in the overview. And again, remember that all these 14 governmental departments agreed to this. And I quote, climate-related risks will continue to grow without additional action. Decisions made today determine risk exposure for current and future generations and will either broaden or limit options to reduce the negative consequences of climate change. While Americans are responding in ways that can bolster resilience and improve livelihoods, neither global efforts to mitigate the causes of climate change nor regional efforts to adapt to the impacts currently approach the scales needed to avoid substantial damages to the U.S. economy, environment, and human health and well-being over the coming decades. So that pretty much sums up a lot of what we're talking about here today. And now we'd like to look at what are some of the things that we can do to solve the problem. So we do have a crisis. We have a lot of people that recognize it as such. And it's important that we understand where we are regarding it. And if you look at these options, select which describes you best, ranging from you don't think it's much of a problem, or you're doing a little bit, making some personal choices, down to you're actively addressing it through personal choices, as well as working for a national policy to lower greenhouse gases. The important thing is that more and more of us need to move down into being actively involved in coming up with solutions. And so over the next day or so, I'd suggest maybe while you're driving or preparing a meal, ask yourself, why am I not fully engaged yet around this climate crisis? Distill it down into a single sentence. Often we'll hear, I don't have time, or I don't feel I understand it well enough, or I have other priorities. 
But whatever your reason is, if you understand what it is, you'll find ways to work through that in order to be able to participate in coming up with a solution and helping. Because we need to move from wait and see to let's get going. And that typically, to keep get going and keep going, requires that you believe the problem is real and that you feel confident to be able to talk with people about it, that you believe there is a solution, that you can be successful, and that you understand there are many actions that can be taken that you can incorporate some into your schedules, and that you know where to get support from other people who are learning and have the same concerns about the climate crisis. Jim and I found that Citizens Climate Lobby was the source to meet all of those criteria. Their education and training is outstanding. A year ago, I would never have felt comfortable to be able to do this kind of a presentation. And they've been involved right from the start in developing a national policy that would be effective. They lay out various kinds of activities that you can get involved with depending on your interests, your skills, your available time. And there are local chapters everywhere across the country that are organized around the values of respectful and nonpartisan collaboration. Well, let's take a look at what makes a good climate solution. First, as we've seen, it needs to drive large scale change and do it quickly. And if we use incentives that support us making choices towards renewable energy, that is a stronger policy. It needs to be perceived to be fair to everyone and to last through time through changes of administration and over the years as we transition away from fossil fuels to renewable energies. And it needs to be healthy for the planet, but yes, you want the outcome to be healthy for us and our economy. What's called a carbon fee and dividend policy meets all of those criteria. In essence, you place a fee on fossil fuels where they enter our economy. And from that revenue that's collected, you return it back to households as a dividend. So let's talk about, well, why will we do this? First, again, remember, the goal is transition away from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Right now, if you think about the cost of fossil fuel energy and renewable energy, over time, the prices have come very close. So what we're going to do is place a fee on fossil fuels, which means alternative or renewable energy becomes more competitive. The next year, you're going to increase that fee on carbon, and that makes renewable energy even more competitive. You can see within a very short period of time, you and I, utilities, municipalities, businesses, we're all going to be wanting to shift to less expensive renewable energy sources. And that market demand is going to grow, drive the investment and the growth into that area. Now we've got a transition period because we can't stop using fossil fuels immediately. We're all too reliant on it. And that's why the dividend is going to come back to our households, because there will be some price increases that we see. For example, gasoline at the pump. The dividend coming back will help offset that. In fact, two thirds of American households will get more in the dividend or break even compared to any increased prices. Good news is that there is right now a bill in the U.S. House of Representatives, H.R. 763, Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. This chart shows you the numbers of co-sponsors, which is very unusual for a federal bill, and shows that there is a lot of developing support on this bipartisan solution. There's four main components to the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend. There's the carbon fee we've talked about. It starts low at $15 a metric ton of carbon dioxide emissions, and it grows each year. The carbon dividend comes back as a monthly dividend to our households. Each adult receives one equal share, and each child 
under the age of 19 receives one half of a share. To protect our businesses during the transition, there will be some adjustments at the border so that carbon goods coming in from a country that doesn't charge an equivalent carbon fee, they're going to pay a fee to us at the border so that our companies cannot be underpriced. And also then there will be a limited pause on some new regulations for carbon dioxide emissions. And that's really fine because this policy will drive down fossil fuel emissions faster than regulations really would be able to. So there's a bill ready to be passed that's effective, it's good for us and the economy, it's bipartisan, and it's revenue neutral. It will reduce America's emissions by at least 40% within 12 years. And it's supported not just by economists and scientists, but by many political and business leaders as simple yet comprehensive and effective. It will improve health. It's going to save lives by reducing air pollution. And the dividend puts money in our pockets to spend as we see fit, particularly helping low and middle income Americans. The lower our carbon footprints become, the more of the dividend is available to spend on other things such as health care or food. 2.1 million additional jobs that wouldn't exist otherwise will be created over the next 10 years. Some of them certainly are going to be in renewable energy fields that are going to grow. But the dividend coming back to us and then being spent back out into the economy stimulates growth across the board. It's a bipartisan bill. And also importantly, I think, for all of us to recognize is that the majority of Americans, regardless of our political affiliation, we want Congress to take action on climate change. And we recognize it can't be caught up in partisan politics. The fact that it's revenue neutral, that the government does not keep the money but sends it back to us, makes it a much smoother process for getting through the legislative process. Now this chart shows just some of the supporters of H.R. 763. And I just wanted to show you the vast diversity and backgrounds of the organizations and the individuals that think that this carbon fee and dividend is absolutely the very next best step we should take towards jumpstarting the getting, getting ourselves under control with the climate crisis. It ranges from Nature Conservancy to Republican, the National Wildlife Federation, Conservatives for Responsible Stewardship, New York Farm Bureau, Cities, George P. Schultz, James Hansen. So there's a bill, there's a lot of support for it, but really it requires you and I expressing our support. And it's time to ask now, okay, what can your action plan be? The first point is really powerful. Don't underestimate that if you share your concern, if you talk with others about the issue of the climate change crisis, you're all going to learn together. You'll find other people are just as concerned. You will influence them to get more involved. Certainly, let's support the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. And this, we need to contact our legislators, which is so easy to do in multiple ways. And if we do it periodically, we're going to let them know that we think carbon, the climate crisis, needs to remain a high priority no matter what other issues come on our plate. Continue to act locally. If you'd like to get more involved, we certainly encourage you to join the Central Massachusetts chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby. Because we do have a climate crisis. When it comes to our climate, winning slowly is losing. And unfortunately, right now, we're still losing. And we need to move over and get onto the winning track. You can get more information at citizensclimatelobby.org and at energyinnovationact.org. Both of these websites 
have information about the bill. They also have links where you can write to your federal congressional representatives about your concerns and your support for taking this action. And Jim and I have provided our information here for you. We're happy to answer any questions you may have. And if you have an organization that you feel would like to hear this information, we are happy to schedule ourselves to come out and meet with you. We thank you for your time, and we certainly hope that you will get involved in implementing climate action. Thank you so much.